fantastic documentary um, and what a profound impact it had uh, globally in uh, exposing the crimes, the waste crimes that were, were occurring in China as a result of many OECD countries um, exporting their waste uh, to China. Um, and that um, resulted in many countries, uh, including Australia, um, uh, being exposed for the for the waste export crimes, um, particularly in uh, for Australia, particularly in Malaysia and Indonesia, um, and uh, really highlighted the uh, practice of hiding contaminated waste behind a thin veneer of of legitimate waste. Um, dig a little deeper, and um, and and that was discovered. Um, so uh, Australia uh, responded, the Australian government responded quite quickly to the um, intense media uh, expose of our waste shipments to Southeast Asia. And they responded with very quickly with a, the world's first waste export ban. Just a, a, a few comments about the Australian waste export ban. Um, so in 2019, the federal government developed their new national waste policy uh, action plan, which set out a timeline for um, banning a range of wastes. And um, basically the entire ban will be implemented by July, 2024. So it's not as um, immediate as, as people would like to think, but it's still very much on its way. And um, in addition to the action plan that the federal government developed to underpin um, this waste export ban, uh, currently in our federal parliament, uh, the Waste and Recycling Act is a new bill. The Waste and Recycling um, Bill is uh, about to be debated and that goes into more detail about uh, what this um, policy framework or how this policy framework will be delivered. It's quite a strong bill. Um, I probably can't say too much about it, but it has very strong penalties, five-year imprisonment for uh, violating this act. So if you illegally export waste, if you knowingly uh, provide fraudulent information about waste exports, you can look at a five-year jail term. It's uh, quite a very strong um, act. Um, it uh, starts with upholding the precautionary principle, which is really great to see, but there are a whole range of exemptions and we have yet to uh, drill down and have a really close look at the exemptions that will come under um, many of the definitions within the Act to see what that might mean for um, industry and uh, importing countries in the Southeast Asian region. But I do want to just highlight uh, some aspects of the Australian, uh, the new uh, national waste policy framework for Australia and um, highlight a couple of things. Um, while the uh, policy framework is, is great at uh, targeting uh, the really important issues of better packaging design, uh, better waste collection, um, you, uh, bit mediocre on uh, requiring the inclusion of recycled content in new manufacturing, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, it does leave the door open quite wide to chemical recycling and waste to energy incineration. And uh, I make these comments because some of the associated plans that the federal government um, is using to uh, justify their new um, policy framework um, includes things like this, the Plastics Infrastructure Analysis Update. Now that's a plan that's designed specifically to um, uh, facilitate the waste to energy incineration industry as a, as a solution to many, as we know, many of the plastics that can't be recycled that end up in the residual waste stream. Um, it also uh, talks a lot about um, uh, process engineered fuel and refuse derived fuel, which are two areas we're watching very closely because we know that, um, for example, in, in South Australia, there's a very um, big uh, uh, cement uh, RDF and PEF um, burning industry related to the cement industry and uh, Resource Co. We know already um, is as well established in Malaysia. Um, and they're heavily invested in South Australia. And we know that um, many states all over Australia are working to reprocess waste and partnering with uh, companies like Resource, Resource Co to um, burn this waste in uh, cement kilns, brickworks industries and waste to energy facilities. 
Um, just jumping ahead a little bit, I wanted to highlight a recent report that came out just um, uh, recently by Interpol um, and highlight the uh, great uh, diagrams if, if people are looking for information about where the global waste trade um, has been operating. And you can see here that um, historically it has been very focused on China and Southeast Asia. Um, and following the uh, China's national sword po policy and the other policies in Indonesia, Malaysia, and the rest of Southeast Asia uh, are looking to um, continue to export uh, to Southeast Asia. Uh, a few things that came out of uh, this strategic analysis of the uh, global waste trade were, were three issues that I think are worth highlighting, and that is the uh, potential increase in illegal plastic waste shipments, rerouting to other countries. We know that that's happening in Indonesia. And many of the uh, containers that were um, stopped at the port haven't really been returned to the host country, the origin of their exporting countries, and they're being rerouted through other countries. That's a significant um, issue uh, that we need to be aware of. Um, also highlighted in the report was the illegal treatment of plastic waste, burning it, um, um, and the falsification of uh, documentation and, and misdeclaration of plastic waste. So uh, this is a, a very important um, report uh, to take note of because particularly in Australia, we're already seeing this since China's national sword policy, numerous waste facilities have gone up in smoke. And I'm highlighting this because um, it's not just an issue for um, developing countries, but even in OECD countries, we're seeing large stockpiles of, of plastic and waste um, catching fire and incinerating. Um, it's a serious issue that um, um, I think we can expect more of. Um, this was recently in Western Australia. This was in Victoria. Um, uh, a clean away factory and material recovery facilities and um, where large stockpiles of baled plastic, baled cardboard um, and paper. These are highly flammable waste stockpiles and um, the uh, issue of the flammability of uh, waste stockpiles in every country um, should be cause for concern. Um, and I'm sure there are other countries around the world that are experiencing the same, the same risks. Jumping forward a little bit to the global response uh, to the plastic pollution um, problem, we've seen um, uh, the uh, corporate sector uh, and the industry sector respond uh, uh, quite rapidly too. And I just want to highlight a couple of these um, uh, reports and policy platforms. Um, we've seen the World Economic uh, Forum uh, develop their um, their uh, white paper on the plastics circular economy and global trade. Um, uh, they've gone into partnership, a global plastic action partnership, and you can see the partners there, very broad representation that involves NGOs, um, industry and governments. And I'm highlighting this because here you can see the UK government through their Carbon Trust um, organisation uh, promoting waste to, energy in, uh, waste to energy incineration in Indonesia. Um, and we have, many of you may have recently heard um, of uh, Twiggy Forest is a mining magnate in Australia. He's a philanthropist. He's uh, launched the See, uh, See the Future campaign to spearhead an industry initiative to um, uh, address the global plastic pollution problem. And, um, and that involves um, um, applying a contribution to industry which um, his philanthropic organisation will manage um, for the rest of um, these um, corporations, um, which will apparently um, um, uh, um, provide a solution to, the, to this global plastic problem. I want to highlight here this um, particular industry narrative because it says a lot and um, it's something that I think um, members in Australia and Southeast Asia should uh, really be uh, taking a close look at and that is the, the, the language that's being used and the approach that's being taken. It's still very embedded in, in the waste management um, issue as a solution to the problem. And it talks about transcending borders, politics and corporate responsibility. Um, it's an inflated industrial narrative 
that I consider it is quite alarming and potentially dangerous because um, it's a it's a, a corporate uh, and global industry narrative um, that um, is in lockstep with uh, industry lobby groups like the Alliance to End Plastic Waste. They're talking the same language. It's um, it's it's about uh, increasing the rights of corporate industry um, and um, uh, focusing very much on waste management and we know that the solution to the global plastics pollution problem and the associated waste trade issue um, won't be found solely in the waste management sector we have to go upstream um, so while uh, those uh, industry narratives are all singing from the same song sheet about investing in chemical recycling, investing in um, plastic to fuel, we know that these are well recognised um, false solutions. In Australia, um, it's no less. We're seeing every state in Australia rolling out and fast tracking waste to energy incinerators, reprocessing facilities that are going to produce uh, process engineered fuel and refuse derived fuel for export. Um, we're seeing uh, Australia uh, investing in chemical recycling and we're seeing them trying to sell this uh, technology and um, um, an education platform, particularly to Indonesia and Malaysia about the regulation of these industries, which is quite ironic because Australia has no experience in these um, kinds of technologies or the regulation of them. So we know that these are these false solutions are a global threat. We know um, that um, that incineration leaves a more hazardous uh, waste stream that needs to be managed. We know that plastic involves more than particles. It involves ocean pollutants, um, and we know that um, they come with severe climate impacts. And these are all members of uh, the Break Free from Plastic and the Gaia uh, community. Um, there's a great report out from the Centre for International Environmental Law that um, highlights and describes much of that. Um, if you want to know more about the threat of incineration, IPEN has just um, uploaded a great uh, learning platform. You can do this uh, training course um, to learn more about the threat of incineration and what that might mean for the Southeast Asian uh, region. You will hear that as long as these incinerators uh, meet best practice EU standards, they're perfectly safe and non-polluting. Uh, this is the um, teaching uh, platform here. These series of, of webinars will dispel those myths and provide you with the information to challenge your own local and state authorities and ask the right questions and, and um, uh, provide the right references to dispel those myths about the EU incinerators. But just to end on a more positive note about what the solutions really um, that we're looking for, is we know that the uh, plastic global plastic pollution problem and associated waste trade is is definitely a cross sector issue, and therefore it's going to require a cross sector uh, solution, and that has to involve upstream attention. It won't be enough to just focus on waste management. We have to redesign uh, our products and systems. But first and foremost, uh, we have to turn off the tap and cap production. It's incongruous with uh, the industry claims to um, move to a recycled plastic content as, as a solution to the plastic waste uh, problem and waste trade problem, while the same industry is, uh, is projecting a fourfold increase in production by 2050. So the first thing we have to turn off the tap and cap production, and we have to mop up the mess that's been left. And that can only be done through investing in zero waste city models to avoid and reduce the amount of waste that's created in the first place and set up the systems to capture that waste and stop it entering the environment. Then we most certainly, and most importantly, need to clean out the cupboard because the residual waste stream is represents uh, the toxic substances that are embedded throughout our entire materials production process. Um, that ends up um, being exported to other countries and causing many of the global impacts um, that we're now facing. And we know that social justice, climate justice and environmental justice has to be underpinning all of these and that these three uh, particular uh, streams of um, legislative reform uh, and global attention is urgent. So I think I've gone over my time, sorry about that. Um, and I'll just shrink and stop my share.
Sorry about that. Thank you so much, Jane. No apologies needed. It was great. And we will now, um, I will now introduce Magaswari Sangar Lingam. Magaswari holds a bachelor's in human development and a master's in environmental management. She has been a research officer in the community and environment section of the Consumers Association of Penang CAP since 1992. Magaswari's responsibility involves assisting communities affected by destructive development projects, by pollution, and by policies that bring negative impacts to the communities and the environment. She advocates for sustainable alternatives to the present policies in areas such as food production and agriculture, natural resource management, waste management, toxics, and other areas as well. She coordinates the organization's community and environment projects and also serves as the honorary secretary of Sahabat Alam Malaysia, Friends of the Earth Malaysia, forgive my pronunciation. Thank you so much. And Magaswari, the floor is yours. I will, sorry, Magus, I believe you're still on mute. Excellent. Oh, still on mute. We will. Okay. All right. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, can you uh, see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. I, I, I believe we, we can see your screen as you see it, but yeah. okay. perhaps that, that also works. Perhaps there's a. All right. Uh, I'm with the Consumers Association of Penang. We're based in the uh, uh, beautiful island of Penang in Malaysia. And uh, we are 50 this year, and uh, CAP is a grassroots uh, nonprofit organization. Um, we look, we link consumer issues with environment and development issues. Um, we fight for the rights of consumers through our research. Um, uh, we do a lot of uh, documentation and um, publications, and we also um, carry out representative activities. This is meaning uh, helping communities to voice out the problems that they are facing. Uh, in the field of environmental protection, uh, CAP champions the interests of citizens and communities against toxic pollution and unsustainable use of um, management of uh, land and other uh, natural resources. So in um, <coughs> this um, session, I will be sharing with you uh, the work that we have done in terms of uh, waste trade and also not only in Malaysia on how trash is landing in uh, Southeast Asia, Asia Pacific countries, and also uh, in other developing countries. Yeah. Um, so the waste trip. Okay, I'm not only going to focus on plastics waste because uh, this waste is coming in all kinds of forms uh, to our countries. So in terms of plastic waste, um, Jane had already elaborated on um, what's happening the, in terms of the flow. Um, like if you see in 2018, I have these figures from UK the plastic waste uh, had gone to Malaysia, Turkey, Indonesia, Taiwan, yeah? and from US also, Malaysia is the top uh, importer of all this um, waste. Okay, and um, the issue is the waste that is coming, the plastic waste that is coming are mixed and contaminated. Yeah? Uh, so this is the main cause of the problem. And when it's uh, low uh, valued plastics, what uh, can be recycled? totally not much can be recycled. What happens is this residual waste is dumped. Yeah? And uh, right now uh, we are also looking into uh, electronic waste because in terms of importing electronic waste, it's just not e-waste. Yeah? Uh, it, plastic is also in the components of the electronic waste. So when the uh, electronic waste recycling factories have already removed what they want, the components they want, they will send it to plastic recyclers. Yeah, to remove the plastic waste uh, for recycling. And um, we are also seeing a few paper waste factories um, being uh, developed here in Malaysia now, because as uh, Jane had pointed out, China is already like uh, trying to close the loop uh, uh, trade uh, in terms of plus, uh, waste that is coming into their country. So all these countries, um, the companies from China are now investing in other countries. And um, we are also seeing paper factories are being 
built here and um, the, in, the major investors are uh, China, uh, Chinese uh, companies. Yeah? Um, there is a recent uh, issue that has come up. One pa uh, paper waste factory, which has got their EIA approved for a, for, um, um, before they can even um, start operations, they've already asked for an expansion and uh, they've already submitted another um, EIA for the expansion of this uh, factory. And the communities around it, um, around the, uh, fac uh, the factory is protesting because what is happening is the paper waste factory will also have their RDFs. They were also going to incinerate whatever things that they cannot uh, be um, uh, recycled. Yeah? So this is also going to become a major issue. Um, and also we are finding uh, hazardous waste um, still being um, illegally exported from uh, developed countries. Although we are part of the Basel Convention, we can uh, we are still seeing uh, scheduled waste. Uh, in Malaysia, we call it um, the, is, um, the hazardous waste is called scheduled waste, waste which is coming into Malaysia yeah, illegally. And uh, the Malaysian government is also has now come up with guidelines to bring in scrap metal. So in terms of scrap metal also, it's like there is toxic content in the scrap metal. So they are preparing uh, guidelines and imposing it. And another issue is it may not come as waste, but this is ship breaking. When you're breaking the ship, the components of the ship, there's asbestos and all other toxic materials in the ship. So this um, has already affected a lot of um, um, workers in Bangladesh and India. Yeah, and uh, this could also be another major issue that we will be looking into. So now that Malaysia is trying to put a stop to uh, getting a mixed plastic waste in, so what's coming in is uh, process engineered fuel, like uh, what um, Jane had already explained. Um, so in, if you can see the picture down there, um, below there, this is supposedly processed engineered, process engineered fuel. Yeah? This was taken in 2015. It, this was waste which had come from um, Australia, imported by Resource Co. Jane had also mentioned that company. So this is, to us, this is not processed engineered fuel. It should come in pellets or in uh, other forms, not uh, contaminated plastic waste. Yeah. And also there's also other waste that's coming into uh, Malaysia and all the other developing countries. To us, this is practically just dumping. Yeah, dumping of waste. And um, the waste that is coming in is also uh, coming in illegally, as I mentioned, in terms of um, uh, electronic waste and also um, hazardous waste. This is also coming in as uh, falsely uh, declared to the customs in their bills of lading. They will declare it as uh, something else. Like, uh, for instance, uh, the PF came in as solid fuel, but what we found was mixed household waste, which is uh, important. Uh, in terms of it is like plastic waste and also e-waste was found when the government was uh, trying to track waste. Yeah? So what are the impacts? So as I mentioned just now, not everything can be recycled so from the plastic waste that comes in. So these are actually just dumped. So the toxic effects are there, uh, dumping of um, residual waste. It's either dumped in agriculture land or near um, uh, the coast, coast. And uh, this is causing problems. Yeah? Uh, and uh, eventually this gets burnt down. And you also saw pictures of, uh, from Jane's uh, presentation, there were factory fires. Yeah, this is also happening in Malaysia where the factories uh, catch fire. And um, either sometimes the, these are deliberately burnt yeah, because you can't do anything about it. Yeah? Uh, what are we going to do with the fat, uh, residual waste? And uh, in terms of electronic waste also that comes in, so whatever components that can be taken, they have uh, removed um, the precious parts. The rest of it is dumped in um, mostly agricultural land and also uh, burnt. Yeah? So this affects uh, uh, public health. The communities who are around um, uh, factories and also these illegal uh, factories are co complaining of air pollution and also in terms of um, their livestock getting sick and um, uh, the waterways are getting polluted the soil is contaminated. So this actually affects the marine life and the aquatic life. And um, what we are end up with, and also the government is ending up with, is the burden of cleanup. Who is going to pay for the cost of cleanup? Because when the waste is dumped, this is mixed waste from we don't know where is, uh, who is the source, yeah? Um, so when it's dumped, who is going to uh, bear the cost, yeah? 
So what happened um, in terms of the picture on the top, top right, uh, the Malaysian government um, engaged a cement uh, plant uh, company to take the waste and burn it in cement kilns. So this is actually not the right solution. Yeah? What we want is uh, there is no actually right solution for all this residual waste. What do we do with it? Yeah? Okay, so the actions that were taken is the communities was uh, in the surrounding this uh, polluting uh, um, factories and uh, dump sites. They had taken action. They also did their own research and they exposed to the media. Uh, the Consumer Association of Penang and also some other groups, uh, NGOs in Malaysia also had to expose this. Uh, this was not only in uh, local media, we also exposed in um, uh, international media, uh, from Australia, BBC, CNN, um, everyone exposed it. And um, the community protests became uh, stronger and the government decided to take action. So if you can take a, uh, take a look, um, and the government started raiding these illegal uh, factories and uh, closed them down. And uh, also in, uh, for a time, they imposed a moratorium of imports of uh, plastic waste and then um, this was lifted, the ban was lifted, because, uh, and right now they are still bringing in plastic waste, but with approved permits. Yeah? And uh, some of this uh, waste, you can see this is supposed to be plastic waste, but it's just contaminated and mixed waste. These are sent back to the country of origin. But we have seen, uh, if you're tracking the containers that were supposed to be sent back, sometimes it ends up elsewhere. Yeah? It's not going back to the country of origin. Yeah, and uh, the Malaysian government and also the NGOs, uh, we also they also were advocating for better policies, yeah, and uh, restrictions at the Basel Convention, last year's uh, Basel Convention, and uh, they were quite active in um, um, getting it done. And so, in terms of um, this right now, you need to have a prior informed consent from the uh, recipient country before any mixed and contaminated waste can be sent, yeah? Okay, so the next, what are the, our demands, yeah? Um, Jane had already pointed out in terms of um, no to false solutions. Even Malaysia is looking into building more waste to energy plants, incinerators, yeah? This is our incinerators in disguise. So uh, all over uh, Southeast Asia, we are fighting against incineration. Uh, this is a, uh, on your top picture from the Ecological Waste uh, Coalition from the Philippines. Uh, and also in Malaysia also, we have already seen two or three um, uh, ways to energy plants being uh, uh, proposed and the communities are already uh, protesting against these proposals. Yeah? Um, as we can see, uh, we can have all these guidelines and um, uh, restrictions of imports or whatever, but we can see that the enforcement is, uh, can the customs inspect all the containers that are coming in. How do we ensure that everything is um, followed? Yeah, because the importers are trying to find uh, loopholes. The exporters are also trying to find loopholes and we can still find illegal um, shipment into our countries. So what we are saying is no dumping and this waste trip. And then we should ban or face out uh, problematic products in terms of like plastic waste and all this. And um, there should be a ban on dirty technology like for us, this, waste to energy plants, incinerators are all dirty technology. Yeah, it looks clean, but they're actually dirty, yeah? Uh, because they are emitting a lot of um, toxic uh, pollutants. And uh, we need, uh, in the meantime, we need to step up enforcement. We could have bans, but we can still see that illegal shipments are happening, yeah? Uh, we need to step up enforcement. And uh, as communities, we also have to be vigilant. If we see any dumping happening, we should uh, inform the authorities and also other NGOs in your uh, vicinity to um, take action on this, yeah. And um, also, um, Jane had already explained clearly in terms of uh, how do we move towards zero waste, yeah. What are the measures to be taken? Redesigning, uh, repackaging, eliminating all these um, uh, toxic um, components. So I would end here uh, so that we can have a discussion later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Magaswari, and thank you also for your, your passionate presentation. I think a lot of the points uh, that you were mentioning, Jane had warned against. So the trend to export waste that are then going to feed burn technologies, which of course not only generate toxic pollution, but also uh, aggravate the climate emergency that we're in. 
So I now have the pleasure to introduce Yuyun Ismawati. Yuyun has broad and rich experience in environmental and waste issues. She is an environmental health advocate, actively involved in chemicals and waste conventions negotiations. Uh, she also works very strongly at the local level and the national level, representing Nexus 3 Foundation, formerly known as Bali Focus. At the national level, Yuyun is one of the co-founders of the Prakarsa, uh, board member also of ICEL, and a steering committee member of the Alliance for Zero Waste Indonesia. She's also proactively working with all stakeholders towards a toxic free future. But Yuyun is also very active at the global level. She's affiliated to the International Pollutants Elimination Network, the WECF, uh, Gaia, and the Basel Action Network as well. Yuyun has actively participated in the Break Free from Plastic movement, advocating the significant reduction of plastic pollution, plastic waste trade and dumping, as well as plastic production. She is, no small feat, a Goldman Environmental Prize awardee from 2009, also a fel an Ashoka Fellow, a LEAD Fellow, and a social entrepreneur. Yuyun holds an environmental engineering degree from Bandung Institute of Technology, Indonesia, and a Master's of Science in Environmental Change and Management from the University of Oxford. Yuyun, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sirene, um, for the introduction. Um, it's awkward to, to hear my own, <laughs> um, myself uh, read by somebody else. Anyway, um, yeah, so thank you so much for um, inviting me in this um, uh, webinar today. Um, uh, hang on, uh, where is it? Okay. Uh, okay, I'm looking for, sorry, that's the wrong one. Um, Okay. Um, yes, thank you for uh, Gaia Asia Pacific for uh, organizing this uh, Learn from the Nuggets. And uh, uh, considering this problem is uh, worldwide now, and I'm so happy to see our colleague from uh, Kenya also participate in this meeting, in this webinar, and also from Maldives. Uh, because the the producers, exporters, and traders are now looking for the new destinations after uh, strong uh, rejections and reactions from the um, Asia Pacific. Um, I would like to start. Um, hang on. How can I do this? Okay. Um, I would like to start with this picture. Um, you've seen a lot also in the picture from my guests uh, that uh, this kind of uh, visual is, is not uh, something uh, new in, in many places in developing countries. Um, I will skip this um, because uh, Sirene already introduced me. Um, I'd like to start with the, the end point or the end uh, impact of plastic waste trade. Um, as um, Margus and um, Jane already explained um, about the movement of waste from one country to another, to another country, um, we, we've seen uh, underground how uh, the impact of mismanage, mismanagement of waste trade uh, being handled uh, by local communities and being ignored by, by government, uh, national level, as well as local level. Um, our report released last year um, shows how far the mismanaged waste import, uh, imported by plastic waste recyclers, as well as paper recyclers, uh, ended up in communities and produced dioxins uh, that ended up in the food chain, especially eggs. Uh, chicken eggs are the cheapest affordable source of protein for communities and they eat it every day and the children as well as as adults but shockingly our findings shows that the chicken eggs from these two village from Tropodo and Bangun village um, containing um, dioxins uh, the second highest in Asia after uh, the dioxins from Agent Orange village in Vietnam 
and comparing the Vietnam War with this war, you can see the stacks um, um, line up uh, in the fire. That's from the village where the plastic waste uh, that was dumped by paper companies being used uh, as fuel. So plastic to fuel is not a good thing because if you have proper laboratory and you, you, you can uh, conduct um, and analyze it in a good laboratory, you can see scary results. So um, you can find this report in the link before below. Um, and uh, this is, we will re release a new report uh, coming soon, um, exploring more about this uh, impact of plastic waste uh, importation. Um, uh, sorry. Um, we have new regulations um, as the response to this chaos uh, after we pointed out the loopholes and addressed this uh, in, in several press releases and in studies. Um, the uh, government of Indonesia released the new regulations uh, and set up the contaminants in the waste that's supposed to be enter Indonesia. Uh, with the number 2%. Um, the 2% contaminant is, um, is a proposal um, following China's standard. China has uh, the standard of 1.5% at the beginning of the 2015-2016, um, um, at the beginning of the green fence uh, operation. And then uh, now China uh, uh, impose 0.5% of contaminants. And initially the Indonesian government uh, aimed to have 0% of contaminants in two years time, but due to the strong lobby of um, recyclers from the US and the UK, the Indonesian government stuck with 2%. Um, so it's, it's crazy how strong the, the recyclers uh, lobby uh, our government. And in the previous webinar at the Basel Convention, even the delegate from South Africa um, also mentioned that um, they were bribed um, to receive uh, containers and so on. So it's not something, um, uh, uh, something new, but this could be practiced all over um, in developing countries, uh, other developing countries. And we have also in Indonesia, the new um, regulations uh, to tackle the waste importation. So now with the new uh, regulation number 58, 2020, the Ministry of Trade um, issued the new uh, rules uh, for waste trade, um, not only plastics, but also um, other eight uh, commodities. Exporters have, uh, have to be registered in Indonesia. But of course, there are lots of confusions uh, in the market because lots of recyclers um, try. Um, sorry. Uh, try to register, but uh, um, the embassy um, they try to come to the embassy. Uh, to register because it was the requirement of the new law. However, the embassies are not ready yet because they haven't got any guidance from um, the, the Ministry of Trade. Um, and, and also there are a list of, of uh, products or um, commodities that are listed in these uh, regulations um, that have to be uh, followed by exporters as well as importers. Um, Yes, yeah, so to, to show you how uh, the plastic waste uh, being traded um, in Indonesia. Uh, I'm sorry, can you see it? Okay, oh, sorry. It's my microphone. Uh, oh, God. Um, okay, uh, so the plastic waste trade in Indonesia, um, um, I have to. Sorry, this is annoying. Okay, um, sorry about this. Uh, yeah, Indonesia have a, a, um, an exponential uh, importation of, of plastic waste um, in 2018. This is the, the year where China closed the door. 
um, and in 2019, um, this data has not been uh, collected. I mean, all countries, uh, not all countries uh, reported yet. So the data of 2019 usually will be completed by the end of 2020. Um, so I guess the, the figure in 2019 is not final yet, and uh, we are expecting to see higher, um, higher volume. However, in the, in the trade, uh, there are some discrepancies and maybe colleagues in other countries also could, can learn about this and check with uh, your statistics bureau because the uh, volume that claim uh, to be exported to one country and then the report from the uh, respective country, in this case, Indonesia, uh, might have discrepancies. Um, these discrepancies could be in terms of um, the volume discrepancies, uh, as well as the currencies uh, because of the, the exchange uh, currencies. But it's always interesting. Um, I always interested in to, to, to see why we have this kind of discrepancies. Um, and if you look at the list of countries exported Um, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, exported to Indonesia. Um, you can see from 2015, USA, um, Australia, and then UK. And in 2016, we started to see Marshall Islands on the list. What the heck? Why Marshall Islands sent it to Indonesia? Um, I think this is the beginning of um, the anticipations uh, uh, done by recyclers in the US uh, and maybe also from other countries that use companies registered in Marshall Island to do business. And it's uh, in Indonesia, the government only recognized country of origin. It means the country where companies registered. So when we see Marshall Islands on, on the list since 2016, we started to dig information because we want to know why Marshall Islands are the highest, um, the top exporters to Indonesia, uh, even uh, higher than the US. Um, this is interesting because this company is actually a, uh, is a mother company, or I don't know, maybe it's a shell company that uh, contracted out all the transactions and trades um, for, uh, using companies in, in other, other countries. Um, and um, due to high uh, illegal transactions, uh, Jane already pointed out the report from um, the Interpol, the newly released report, uh, that actually uh, I can confirm it uh, underground because um, the illegal trades of, um, in this case, plastic waste, Indonesia within the period of um, July until October or yeah, maybe October 2019, confiscated about 2,224 containers and half of it are illegal. Um, because they have no proper paperwork. And this number of 1,078 containers came from one company. So this company was the one that we reported because we investigated in the field and we saw a lot of waste um, distributed by this company and, and, and they sold it, to, they, they sell all the unwanted um, uh, stuff to the communities and the recyclers. That's how we found out um, in the field. And then we ask uh, around, uh, where did you get this from? And then they said they queue uh, at the factory uh, of this uh, recycler um, once a week. Um, they got the unwanted, um, they got the unwanted uh, uh, plastic waste uh, and they process it for the communities. It's, um, I think it's, it's a, it's a, it's the it's the low scale economy for for the communities uh, also although for the companies it's not a big chunk of of um, revenues but uh, um, from the from the investigations that uh, we did in, on the ground we also uh, heard from from some workers that companies also received um, they got paid. Um, 
to receive extra containers. Um, and if you receive $10,000 for containers, that is nice. Um, so if you, you can imagine how much they receive if they get paid $10,000 per container and then they have 1,078. That's enough to, uh, so to do nothing, but they get money, um, but they don't responsible for this. So the government of Indonesia claimed that they have returned to senders and also it was quoted in the uh, uh, report of Interpol. So return to senders or repatriations or re-exportation, they are those are the words used by by government to show um, that um, the enforcement being implemented however you have to take a look at that words um, re-exportations repatriations return to sender it could be different meaning and different implementation um, so we have the case uh, that we followed um, there were about uh, 70, it was 120 containers that supposed to be returned to the US. Uh, 20 uh, containers arrived in Germany as, as it was uh, planned. And then to uh, Australia also, I think it's about 20 or 30. And then the rest of them, 25 containers that supposed to be returned to the US ended up in ended up in Gujarat and then Uttar Pradesh and, and in other countries. Okay, and then another containers, 30 containers, uh, when they said return to senders, uh, it was supposed to be all of them ended up uh, in the US, but um, it's, it's scattered around, one in Mexico, Netherlands, one in Netherlands, one in Canada. So it means um, the containers returned from Indonesia do not really, repatriated, but but they just sell it to another traders located in the exporters country. So um, it's, it's, they call it B2B scheme, so business to business. But under the Basel Conventions, when the container is uh, contaminated by um, uh, hazardous waste, it should not be traded and Indonesia also party to Basel um, and we should uh, follow the, the rules and comply with the rules. But hey, this is a global shell game. So be aware that uh, maybe colleagues in Africa will see this kind of game, um, just watch out. Uh, so the recommendations, uh, I echoed uh, all the recommendations that given by Jane previously. Um, I would like to address some points that are relevant to Indonesia, but also uh, to the exporting countries that um, we proposed at the beginning um, to have zero or at least 0.5% of contaminants uh, if the government will still allow the importation of waste and so on. And we are glad um, we welcome the Basel Amendment on plastic waste trade, although that will be it will be a lot of challenges to implement the new amendment and it will need a strong intelligence as well as the, uh, the check uh, at the port at the checkpoint. Um, uh, there's a strong lobby from the US uh, and the UK recyclers uh, towards this contaminant percentage. They've been heavily um, negotiated and, and, and come and approach um, either the surveyors company um, or the associations of the industry uh, to have this um, contaminants percentage um, limit not too low because we support recycling. So it's not good to have 0%, okay? So now the Indonesian government stuck with 2%, but we keep pushing um, that um, following um, the provisions of the Basel Amendment, uh, we have to adopt also the law um, into Indonesian law. Um, there are several discussions um, and discourses also um, about the capacity of um, recycling in Indonesia. One is the source of recycling. Um, companies claim that uh, Im the imported waste are cleaner and easier to get. So that's why they um, imported waste. Uh, but at the same time, also in Indonesia, we don't have any system how much we can get um, um, 
um, plastics or, or bottles um, that can be recycled from which source. So that information are not available. And also the capacity of um, uh, factories um, to recycle, um, it should not exceed 50% of, of their supplies. Uh, so, I mean, the imported, the imported materials, uh, either plastics or, or paper, should uh, only 50% of, of their capacity. So the rest of it have to be supplied from domestic sources. Um, this is uh, a bit challenging because the industry want to have a secure supplies and we don't have uh, such mechanism in Indonesia to, to give us um, um, assurance um, for uh, companies to supply them uh, in, a, in, a, in a solid and, and steady amount. <clears throat> Another interesting point is that from the illegal um, uh, importers uh, sanctions and this uh, in particular the 1000 containers, I haven't seen any, um, we haven't seen any uh, court decisions um, how they are going to punish this company. Um, but only some suggestions that these 1000 containers have to be um, uh, destroyed and the government is now looking for the way how to incinerate this 100, uh, this 1,000 containers, and and who and how, and it's it's another interesting angle. But um, the law enforcement and and sanctions for importers are not clear. Um, yeah, so we hope that in the future we will have a better law enforcement. Um, yeah, so I will end it here. Um, better design. Um, more recycling rate, uh, really the, the one that we have to push. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Yu Yun. Thank you, Magus. Thank you, Jane. Uh, we're now going to move to the Q&A. Uh, so everybody, this is the time to share your questions. I see we have a couple of questions that we're going to start with. Um, first question is to you, Yu Yun. Uh, can you share your methodology for tracking the international waste trade? Do you collaborate with some competent authorities? And thank you for your presentation. That's a question from Fuang and Guyen Huang. I apologize again for my pronunciation. So Yu Yun, that's yours. And you're on mute. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, um, yes, yeah, so we, we work uh, in collaboration with Basel Action Network for this. Um, we have received also the list or numbers of containers from uh, our source. That's um, the, the first key to track uh, the containers is that you got to have the numbers of the containers. And there are several platforms um, that you can use to track uh, containers. As long as you have the number of the containers, the code, it will be um, like a nine, 12 digits long uh, numbers. And then if you copy and paste that number in that website, uh, track my containers or track my, um, uh, where's my containers, you know, because as it, it's like, uh, it's, it's like our purchase in the Amazon or Alibaba, any small products, you can trace it, you know, you can track. So now containers are huge, they are big uh, size. So it should be also be able to be tracked. Um, so if you can get the, the container numbers, you can put it in that website and then see where they go to or where they start from. So you can see it from there. But um, to follow until the end, um, the, 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 the routes where the containers follow um, will be, uh, you, you, you will need a, a special software for that. And our colleague from Basel Action Network will be able to help you if you, if you know how to get the container numbers. So we work with them. So they run the numbers and we follow them for two months because that's the, uh, that's the the length of, of, of 
travel of the containers until they reach the, 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 the destinations. Because once you put the container numbers, you will see where they are going to and then when they are scheduled to be there to, to arrive in that port. Um, and in the reports of Global Shell Game, you can find it um, at, the, at the annex of the reports where they stop and every containers have the number. Um, so it's ended up in India. Um, yeah, you can contact me uh, and I will introduce you to Jim Bucket if you need it. Thank you. Thank you, Yu Yun, and a great point also, you know, transparency, the work that you're doing and that uh, many people can do if they get the, with the help of, of the experts you mentioned is so important because it is only because of the lack of transparency that these, that, that dumping is happening, right? Um, because instead of dealing with the consequences of the waste in the countries it's being generated, they're outsourcing the pollution to countries where the waste is being dumped. Um, please let me take this opportunity just to mention that since we are live also on Facebook, on Gaia Asia Pacific Facebook page, you folks who are watching on Facebook, you can post your questions there. We're also live on the pages of Alliance Zero Waste Indonesia, Nexus for Health, Environment and Development, National Toxics Net Network, Sahabat Alam Malaysia, and Consumers Association of Penang. So um, please do share your questions, especially on the, on the Gaia Asia Pacific uh, Facebook page, and we'll make sure to, to have a look and answer them. So thank you, Yoon, again for this point about how do we track a container. Um, we also have a question from Sarah Chan, and that's also, I guess, to you, Yoon, but also to Magas and to, to uh, you, Jane. Uh, what trends do you see compared to last year? Are we seeing any improvements already or, or you know, how are things evolving? Um, and I guess maybe we'll, we'll just take this question and then I might group the, the next series of questions, but we're good for time for now. So we can just go one by one until, until things evolve. Okay, I, I can respond first. Uh, in terms of the trends of waste coming in, as uh, Yuyun had mentioned, uh, Basel Action Network, they have already notified. There were uh, electronic waste which was coming from US, but US is not party to Basel Convention, so they are not supposed to send out electronic waste to Malaysia. So um, the government took action uh, because we got notification from uh, Basel Action Network. And uh, there were also, uh, we were also informed about um, hazardous waste, which was being uh, shipped to Malaysia. It was in transition to uh, Indonesia. So from Romania, they sent to Malaysia and to be shipped to Indonesia. So that also we were notified. Um, Bus Election Network uh, got information and we were notified and we informed the Malaysian government and they took action. Um, they stopped the consignment in Malaysia. And, but now, uh, but we do not know what happened to the consignment. It's supposed to be sent back. So, uh, and in terms of uh, plastic waste, also we still see um, uh, consignments coming in. Uh, it hasn't stopped because we have till end of this year um, when the uh, plastic uh, amendments uh, come into force. Yeah, before the Basel Convention. And uh, yeah, as I mentioned just now, we are also look, uh, seeing a lot of paper waste coming into Malaysia, but we, um, we hope that it's not going to be the same situation as what was experienced in Indonesia, paper waste, which was mixed with plastic waste. And I think it was like 70% contamination, wasn't it, Yuyun? Yeah, in terms of some of the consignments. Yeah, so we hope uh, that doesn't happen in Malaysia and whatever which is being uh, sent and um, hopefully it is being uh, tracked by the government also. Yeah, and they are checking whether these are not contaminated. Thank you. Thanks, my guess that's really interesting what you're saying about the trend of increasing uh, paper waste in, uh, exports to Malaysia. And I think the paper waste really illustrates the contamination issue, right? If you have a shipment of paper waste and you know 30%, 70%, big percentage of it is plastic, then you can only imagine the kind of pollution that's going to cause because the mills are not equipped to deal with that plastic, even if that plastic were free from toxics, which is not a given. So thanks for that. And I, I don't know, Jane, uh, 
Perhaps did you have anything to add or you yoon on the trends you've seen in the last 12 months? Um, Jane, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Different screen and I couldn't find the unmute button. Um, I think for me, the, the question is, has there been significant improvement? Yes and no. Um, yes, in, for Australia, yes, in terms of our government responding, um, um, and uh, but no in terms of... Um, well, yes, in terms of uh, declaring a waste export ban and, and setting up a framework to uh, um, to implement a new waste policy framework and um, deal with um, a waste trade, but no, in terms of um, uh, there are still we're still exporting waste to Malaysia, particularly um, we're still stockpiling vast amounts that are catching fire, and we're increasingly dumping it in landfill. So it's a bit of yes and no. I think we're heading in the right direction in Australia, but I think we've got a, a long way to go yet, and and the proof will be in the pudding. I think in um, in um, how bona fide the classifications and the definitions around. All, all of that go whether Australia will sign on to the Basel Amendment, their signatories to the Basel Convention, but they haven't signed on to the, the new amendment yet. I think there's still a long way to go and it's a, it's a, a bit of a difficult question to answer, but um, a, um, a, a modest yes with a big question mark from Australia. Thanks, Jane. That's, that's really interesting to hear. And I think Australia is a good case in point to warn us about the possible loopholes. So you can commit as a country to stop exporting plastic waste. But as long as you're still exporting refuse derived fuel or other forms of pelletized waste for burning, are you really uh, uh, improving the situation or are you just transforming the way in which you continue to dump your waste overseas? So thank you for that, Jane. Um, Yuyun, did you have any any additional comments? Yes, um, I would like to say also moderately, humbly, yes, there are progress, um, but not as 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 uh, high as we expected. Um, so the progress that we've seen uh, in the last twelve months uh, was that because we highlighted the mismanagement of the uh the contaminants in the in the plastic waste and paper waste um which is rich to up to 60 percent uh my guess so uh paper companies when they sorted the bales they will put it in a in a thumb, big big trommel and wash it because um to recycle paper, it will be nice to have pulp so all the waste will be washed in that drum and coming out and it will be separated. So it will not be digested in the machine, but it will be separated because they have different density and so on and so on. It's not wet like the pulp. So in one at the end of the separation, um, what do you call it? It's like conveyor belt. Uh, those are the, the plastic scrap that you see in, um, in, in the cover of my presentation. So those unwanted waste, um, some of them sold to the community, some of them are donated as a community development program uh, by, by either by plastic recyclers or, or paper recyclers company, um, and then utilized by the communities to feed um, the tofu factory as fuel. So after our report released uh, and highlighted the dioxins in uh, chicken eggs, um, in, in that tofu factories and in open burning site, the government replaced, or uh, how should I say, uh, they encourage um, tofu makers to use wood um, and, and force the paper companies to provide them with uh, firewood instead of uh, with the plastic waste. So for, for the tofu makers are now, some of them change, but some of them still use the, the um, but the, that practice to use uh, uh, plastic as fuel for tofu uh, has been uh, decreasing. 
although not as not 100% uh, as we wanted to. And then the second, there's a new regulations um, in Indonesia that tighten up the export import, the import, the importation, especially uh, of plastic waste and paper waste. And the new regulations actually at the beginning, um, it was only allowed to enter eight ports in Indonesia, but lots of protest from the recyclers uh, from the US and the UK. So, uh, and also from uh, domestic uh, companies. So the government have to change the new regulations to the new one <laughs> that's allowing them to, to enter Indonesia through all the, the ports again, but exporters have to be registered. That is a, a new thing because initially we don't have that rules. So anyone can export it to Indonesia, but they don't have to be registered in Indonesia. So that's a, a, a good step. And then the third is that the government already issued now the list of prohibited items to be imported. However, uh, it still has the uh, 391590 and 470790, which is the, um, the mixed, um, mixed paper, mixed plastics that, is the, that could be used as the entry point of mixed waste. Um, so it's still there. Um, we would like not to see that list um, with nine zero a commodity uh, following China because in China also they prohibited uh, three three nine one five nine zero and then four seven zero seven nine zero a commodity um, in a China ban list. So we would like to follow what China China uh, already done. Um, if China can do that, we can do it too. I mean, why why not? Um, but apparently recyclers in the, in the global north, they don't like it um, and, and claim that, oh, we still, um, it's, it's good, you know, for recycling. So 0% is not good. It's bullshit. 0% is good for us because it means we, 0% contaminant is good because it means we receive only um, the materials that we, we are going to, to recycle. Um, so yeah, um, that's good. Uh, and then uh, and, uh, additionally, the government also already set up a um, task force for this. So there is a task force, um, task force um, dedicated to see and, and monitor this, uh, this, tra this trade now, um, which is good, but um, Sorry, we are still outside of the task force, but we keep we keep watching them. So, yeah, have to be positive. Absolutely, and very good to know that you are watching that task force, Yu Yun. And and the point you make about contamination is really important, just for context in terms of regulation. So we have these new Basel Convention rules that say any mixed and dirty, any halogenated plastics, any plastics that are not explicitly going for recycling, they need prior consent. But the Basel text, it says that the plastic have to be virtually free from contamination, but it doesn't give a figure. So there you have, it's open to all interpretations in bad faith. And that's why it's really important for your country as an exporter or as an importer to commit to a really low percentage. So what China had before the total ban was 0.5%. Even that is debatable if you're talking about contaminants that really have a potential to, to pollute a lot. But I think 2%, that's what the industry used to commit to voluntarily. So it's clearly not an effort. It's clearly uh, not a progress from the status quo. Um, and if that's what Indonesia is considering today, I think other countries have to uh, show the way and, 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 and go for uh, levels that are much more ambitious than that. And it's really, I guess the initiative is with the importing countries because exporters will say, why would we why would we make more efforts than are required from us by the importers? So that's that's our role. And if you're interested in looking into this in your country, uh, do get in touch with Gaia Asia Pacific. We'll make sure to, to put you in touch with folks who are already doing that work in their country so that we can share the knowledge and, and advance the advance the work. So we have a, yes. The question about contaminants in the Q&A um, box. Uh, how to define it. So in Indonesia, the contamination uh, in a container uh, will be assessed by the Ministry of Environment. Um, the suspected containers will be set aside by the customs and then the Ministry of Environment people will come and they will uh, inspect the containers. Sometimes they will 
take out of the content. Um, it's you know empty the empty the containers, but that will take place only at the um, property of the factories, but not in the not in the in the port. Uh, some ports in Indonesia are already equipped with the X-ray, so they can see from the scanner um, what will be the content inside the containers, but it needs a good eye and, and um, to see what's in it. If, if it has um, leak um, or something that leaked, um, then from the scanner you can see it. Um, but also the Ministry of Environment uh, team will collect some samples from inside the containers and then they will analyze it in the lab, whether it's containing um, what kind of oil, um, what kind of um, stuff, uh, maybe from computers or from other stuff. So they will announce it contaminated by hazardous uh, waste. Yeah, thank you, Yu Yun. And there's a, also a, a, an important question there do countries that export their waste uh, count the exported waste as recycled in the regulations in general or in their EPR regulations in particular? I know it varies in many exporting countries, but Jane, do you know how Australia used to count those before the ban? Did they, did they claim that those were part of their recycle, recycled material uh, targets or do you know how they count them? Um, well, industry likes to claim that it meets targets, but in reality, um, recyclable materials that are collected through curbside recycling systems or, or um, um, even uh, offices and, and, and industry, um, they go to material recovery facilities, they get bailed, and then it's those uh, companies that decide where they sell that waste to. So I'm sure, like many other OECD countries, Australia, the waste disposal sector monopolises waste management. Um, so they do all the collection, they bail their waste, they decide where it goes because they then have that waste and they're entitled to sell it to whoever they want. They provide no data about whether that waste is bona fidely uh, recycled in any way. It's a once uh, a waste leaves the curbside or the office or the industry and goes to a recovery centre, um, there's very little information about what happens after that. We know that paper and cardboard is still being exported to Malaysia. We know that, we know that uh, there's many exports still occurring now. Um, even the, um, we don't have many extended producer responsibility systems, um, but we do have a container deposit scheme that's, that's coming in, um, in many states. But there again, you know, uh, corporations like Coca-Cola, um, Unilever, Nestle, all those are, uh, are all involved in these schemes and there's no guarantee that those collected recyclables actually get recycled into new products um, and we know and, and expect that some of them will be going to be shredded, pelletized, or, or go for incineration. So it's really hard to find out that information but I, I don't have any confidence in, in saying that all of the recyclable material that's been collected in Australia, whether it's through an EPR system or through the regular uh, waste management systems are going to actually be recycled. And we know that much of that waste can't be recycled. There's just um, resource recovery centres are not recyclers. It's about how the waste is processed. And this is where Australia is heading. They're going to reprocess waste more and more so that they can sell it and ensure that it goes to bona fide a recycler. So that will be in the form of, of pellets or, or clean shredded plastics. Um, um, but the information about the final destination for the recycled uh, material, that's, um, that's just not available yet. Thank you, Jane. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, oh, I have an echo. Great. Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, crime and mismanagement thrives in, in, in the shadows. You know, the lack of transparency that you're pointing to is exactly the kind of climate that allows things that are uh, that the industry claims are going for recycling to then get burnt or mismanaged uh, with impunity. And again, you know, what, what, what is the issue with contamination? Even if you have a shipment of plastic that is theoretically recyclable, whatever the contamination level in there, 
that's going to be essentially transfers that are going for disposal. So we're sending to Indonesia, Malaysia, shipments of, uh, that have maybe some plastic that might be recyclable, but a lot of stuff that is absolutely not recyclable and, and therefore gonna end up as pollution uh, or, or disposed in a way that is usually very pollution intensive. And related to that, there's a question from Shyamala, um, India faces the problem of not only plastics that are contaminated with hazardous contaminants, but plastics that are actually hazardous themselves because they are you know, used uh, pesticide containers um, or uh, petroleum-based hazardous materials. And, and, and a lot of those wastes are going to India. They're there already. They're obviously, if there's any attempt to recycle those, the end product is also highly hazardous. Um, what is your advice on the best way to manage those materials, those wastes, those hazardous wastes, when they're already in a country like India? Tough question, I know. I would just add, from, we have a, um, a program in Australia called Drum Muster. So we have a system specifically for those kinds of containers. Uh, but um, in principle, from Australia, um, Australia has no system, and, and I'm, I'm answering um, York Ed's uh, question as well. Australia doesn't have a system to monitor the final destination of the recyclables or the waste that they export. They really don't know what happens to the waste uh, uh, once the resource recovery um, uh, facilities take that waste, they bail it. It is then up to those waste management at uh, waste disposal companies to on sell that um, waste as a product and there's no requirement in Australia for um, verification that that's a bona fide recycling um, outcome. So that is something that the new policy uh, framework in Australia, the new legislation that's just being drafted now, that's looking to address all of that. And while I don't know the specifics um, in detail, um, what has stood out to me is that it's a very solid piece of legislation. It has a really good um, uh, framework, but there are tons and tons of exemptions in it. So we need to troll through that and understand what those exemptions mean, because I suspect um, the devil's in, in that detail. But certainly, um, this was the big expose for Australia was our Australian government uh, cried that they didn't know that our waste was being exported and dumped in other countries. So now they're trying to uh, address that. So from Australia, there really isn't good tracking. There isn't really good databases. There really, um, uh, the waste disposal industry has um, incredible powers, uh, powers in my opinion, that go beyond what they should be entitled to have and have really driven um, their role in this global waste trade uh, uh, crime spree that, is, as, that has been happening very much in the South, Southeast Asian region. So um, that's very much what Australia is looking to um, uh, resolve and um, we're all keen to see um, uh, what comes up with that and we'll be monitoring to make that the best that we possibly can. But um, it's a very, I'm sorry, it's not a very uh, confident answer. Um, it, it's the awful truth. We really don't know where much of our recycled waste is going specifically and we can't be assured that it's going to a proper uh, recycling facilities. Thank you, Jane. And, and uh, perhaps to come back to the, the question of the hazardous plastics themselves, uh, not providing you, Shyamala, with a, with a practical answer, but you know, these wastes are extremely challenging to manage in a good manner, to make them safe. And that's why we have the Basel Ban Amendment. That's why the trade in those hazardous wastes should, is prohibited by the amendment. And you know, we encourage more countries to join it uh, so that those situations don't happen anymore. Because in a way, uh, once you get to that stage, it's really hard to or impossible to achieve an outcome where you have zero toxic impacts. Um, I, I don't know, perhaps if there's uh, you, Unum, I guess you had uh, some comments on this question of how to manage the hazardous plastics once they're already in your territory or what, what can be done to, to, to try to minimize the harm from them. 
I don't know. I don't know what to suggest, but um, because all of these plastics contaminated by hazardous waste or plastic that uh, is hazardous at the moment, uh, not regulated and already imported, um, I guess there are some period of um, transitions period, how countries have to adjust and, and, and plan uh, and when this new regulations uh, enforce globally by the 1st of January, um, then uh, we hope that all countries have the um, regulations and strategy how to handle it. But at the moment, um, I think all the contaminated plastics are, will still be used and, and recycled. And there are reports also um, uh, done by, by IPEN and Arnica um, that analyzed uh, several children's toys from all over the world and that was made from plastic recyclers, uh, plastic re recycled plastic, and it has uh, um, high toxic substances in it. So um, at the moment, there is no requirement to declare what's in what, what kind of chemicals in the recycled plastic. So um, it's only physical and whether it's granular or uh, in, a, in the shape of uh, mostly granular uh, like pellets, but there is no requirement to declare what's in it uh, when you trade it. Um, so I guess at the moment um, it will still be continued to be recycled and melted and whatever uh, molded. Um, because as, as long as there is no regulations, you can't do anything because companies or factories will not do anything if it's not required by law, um, unfortunately. Yeah, so I think it's our role to keep pushing for this issue and, and raise this issue. So um, it become the attention of our government um, to address this issue. So yeah, it's, it's a lot of work to do, um, but um, there are still, you know, we talk about the gen um, to implement it underground. It's not that easy. And um, as an outsider, I mean, we are not inside the factory. We are not the companies who, who deal with all these things every day. But uh, for them, it's the production targets and, and the profits that they have to, to create and maintain. Um, of course, they also ask for government to, to protect their investment. Um, so government have to play, you know, to please them. That's why I see also why the 1000 containers, um, the company has not been sanctioned, but they were planning to shut down their company because um, they have some administrative problem too. And the new law in Indonesia also make everything worse because um, the sanctions and then the uh, administrative sanctions also in some in the new law it was deleted. So we have the omnibus law, the new law in Indonesia, that that make all the the bad things easier to do. Um, so anyway, so during COVID there are lots of bad regulations being issued. Um, yeah. Yep, thanks, Yoon, yeah, for mentioning yeah. that. I guess uh, sorry, it's I cannot... the, uh... I'm sorry. Thanks, but th th that that is that is uh, sort of an answer, which is you know really the the point where we can have influences is on preventing, and the issue of uh, of, of sanctions of enforcement is extremely important. You know, the same law with a small fine or a prison sentence has very different implications, um, uh, and and you know. High fines can play a role as well in transferring uh, the costs from, uh, you know, basically taxpayers in the community that's receiving the waste to uh, the polluters or those at least who um, who are responsible for the export itself. Um, there was a question from Sidika from Esdo on on Facebook on uh, the uh, waste container that went the export that went from Bangladesh to Maldives and and you know what's the situation and. How many containers that was, and 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 Magess here has has told us that uh, the government of Maldives has. Oh, Magess has more information. Go for it. Malaysia. It's actually uh, the question was how many containers were sent to Malaysia, 
Um, so the Malaysian government had announced that uh, they are going to send back one container from Bangladesh because it uh, contained um, mixed waste. Yeah. So in terms of uh, importation of uh, plastic waste, the Malaysian government um, has restrictions. They will only allow imports of homogeneous uh, plastic. Yeah. So it's like single plastics uh, type and also clean plastics. So other than that, if it's contaminated or has some hazardous content, then that would be sent back. So if they manage to scan the container and then they find that it's mixed or contaminated waste in there, then only they will send it back. So uh, I don't know whether we have resources to scan every container that comes in. And so that's an issue. And also to check on the contamination uh, limits. Thanks, my guest, for, for the important correction. Um, I was jumping over to the next question about Maldives. But before that, I think a lot of what uh, you all commented on is how when illegal exports happen, um, instead of there being a real effective return to sender, so return of the container with, with, with the polluting plastics to the country that exported it, it often ends up either uh, sent to a third country uh, which is usually a global south country, or it gets burnt, incinerated, or, or, or co-processed, incinerated in a cement kiln uh, locally. And so that actually makes the situation, you know, it, it's, it's just transforming one kind of pollution into another kind of more concentrated, more toxic pollution. Um, so the issue of, of you know, enforceable uh, sanctions is really important. And I guess there is a way to for the burden not to be on the importing country. And again, you know, China has shown what effective enforcement means in terms of the plastic waste trade. They are inflicting high fines on the ships and on the uh, traders that are that are sending the illegal exports. So now major shipping companies have said we will not take those containers to China in the first place because we don't want to be stuck in port with a Chinese official and a big fine. Um, so we're not going to take those containers in the first place. And, and, and that shows that it is possible to pressure, to push the focus, to push the responsibility back on the exporters in the first place. But that requires, you know, strong and clear uh, fines, dissuasive fines and, and you know, and, and, and uh, consistent in enforcement from inf importing countries. Um, so to move on to Maldives, since Maldives was on my mind, um, We've seen that, you know, in Maldives, uh, there is also, uh, you know, the question of waste trade is relevant. The question of plastic waste is relevant. However, uh, local officials seem to think that uh, zero waste is a utopian dream and that the way to go is incineration with a little bit of energy recovery. Uh, what do you think about that position that, you know, trying to reduce waste, trying to redesign, trying to separate is utopian and the way to go is just to keep producing as much plastic as we are and just burn it and have a little bit of maybe 20% efficiency electricity at the end. I have, so I'll jump in and have a go. Uh, sorry, I, I have answered, um, I, I have typed my answer in the, in the Q&A. But uh, yeah, as I mentioned there, the, the solutions uh, for um, with energy in Maldives is not uh, appropriate because um, uh, as I explained in the chat uh, and Jane also can add this information, um, the release of toxics from waste incinerators are higher than uh, when you have landfills uh, versus zero waste, you know. So zero waste is not going to release any toxic emissions, but waste to energy will release toxic emissions from the stack as well as from fly ash and also in wastewater um, because they need to wash uh, everything. Um, so it's, it's going to add another burden because um, countries that have uh, incinerators should have also hazardous waste landfill, which is more expensive and more fancy than the normal landfill. Um, and I don't think um, with the capacity of uh, developing countries like Maldives, you will be afford to pay for um, the operational cost. Um, it's very expensive, especially if you have to um, install the air pollution control um, equipments, as well as the continuous emissions monitoring system. 
CEMs, that's very expensive. Um, the, the recent experience in, in Ethiopia, it was not functioning. It, it was launched um, uh, maybe two years ago, or yeah, it was two years ago or last year. It was announced, um, you know, the first big incinerator in Africa, blah, 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 blah. A boop, only two months. But you can't, they cannot afford to pay for the operational cost. And um, yeah, Jane can talk more about the impact and so on. Thanks, Yunyun. I was just going to point out there's this um, false comparison happening all the time that it's either incineration or landfill, or that zero waste means more landfill. It's a false comparison. And um, I think it's a narrative that's really strongly targeted, an industry narr narrative, strongly targeted at um, uh, small islands, uh, developing states. It's, it's quite insidious because the the economic basis, the tourism, the, the, the local economies, the, the very things that make islands um, such um, um, ecologically significant and, and beneficial to the, particularly the communities that live there, are all put at risk with incineration. So um, I think it's a false comparison to, to say that zero waste equals landfill and that a comparison of zero waste with incineration means landfill versus incineration. It, that's a false comparison because we know that incineration actually generates the need for hazardous waste landfills. Um, and it's important to note this because that's the argument that governments um, and industry use, particularly on island states. There's no room for landfill. So we have to have some super duper technology to um, stop us dumping the waste in landfill because we don't have room for it. Um, well, incineration um, will leave residues not only in the form of hazardous ash that will have to be landfilled, but also in the surrounding marine environment where um, those uh, island states rely on for, for food, for their economies, for tourism. So the very things that are so valuable, um, important to island states um, uh, will get traded off, will become external, uh, external risks through um, um, incineration. So I'm, I'm aware that um, the specific issues that island states face um, are, are very intense. And I'm aware that Gaia has put some time and energy into that. I know Fallen Great um, has done a lot of work in that area. Um, island states are particularly vulnerable to incinerator, small scale incinerator technologies, because you can't have big, huge incinerators there. They're going to be likely to be small scale pyrolysis uh, technologies. There'll be less regulation, um, oversight, the risks just increase. So out of all of the um, locations for incineration, island states are the um, most inappropriate. That's what, it, what, that's what makes it a really important issue for Indonesia because Indonesia is, you know, many, many, many islands, um, same as the Philippines. It's an issue throughout the whole Southeast Asian region. That's what makes incineration a specific threat to Southeast Asia because of the, the, um, the land um, size issues, um, but also being close to the equator. You know, if we want to talk about um, climate impacts from the vast amounts of climate and toxic air pollution that incinerators put out, putting that into the um, equator is not the right location and it can't be defended in terms of um, a, a climate analysis. So um, my opinion is island states are the least appropriate place for um, incinerators and that makes the whole Southeast Asian region inappropriate for uh, the push of incinerator top technologies into that region. Thank you, Jane. <laughs> and since we're talking about Indonesia, I have a question here from Saras Granita from Indonesia. Um, so since we've seen these problems with, with uh, waste dumping, since we've seen plastic pollution in the ocean and on, on land, since uh, it, apparently incineration isn't a solution, uh, what about biodegradable plastic? Is that the way to go? Do you think it's a, do you think it's a, a solution? Or you, what, what, what are the environmental impacts?
And you can just go for it if you have something to say. <laughs> My guess. Yeah, so I can share what Malaysia is doing. They have this roadmap towards uh, banning single, uh, elimination of single use plastics. But there are a lot of it is they're also doing research on um, using bioplastics as an alternative. But we are against these two because in terms of bioplastics, uh, there would still be additives, chemical additives into it, right? Yeah, and um, so, and you are still using fossil fuel in terms of uh, uh, producing the bioplastics. So it's not actually biodegradable, yeah? And if it's biodegradable also, you will still, some of it would uh, degrade, but in terms of the additives, you're not sure what additives is getting into it. And um, so for us, uh, we are still against this. What we are encouraging is for people to use uh, traditional biodegradable um, items. Like uh, in uh, Southeast Asian countries, we used to use uh, leaves yeah, to um, pack food or something. Um, and in terms of packaging also, we are looking into like naked packaging. You don't need all those packages. And there are also a lot of uh, zero waste stores that have come up uh, where you can buy things in bulk and bring your own uh, containers or um, uh, bags to uh, pack your uh, stuff. So biodegradable packaging or bioplastic is not actually available. So anything yeah. else to add on, my friends? Yeah. Well, if I if I can if I can abuse my my moderator prerogative, I would add that so-called biodegradable plastics, so-called, are still plastics. A. So when 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 they are certified compostable, if they are not in an industrial composting facility, they will still pollute just the same way as fossil-based or non-compostable plastics pollute. So that's two. So do, do our countries have industrial composting facilities and is it guaranteed that all of those so-called compostable plastics will end up there? That's not even the case in Berkeley, California that has very old and well experienced industrial composting. You know, we see regular bins full of PLA from your local cafes, you know, takeaway cups and they are just interfering with recycling and ending up in nature and interfering also with, with the composting actually. So even the matter of how well they compost in industrial facilities, that's debated in the compost community. Three, the environmental impact. So if you're talking, because obviously the bioplastics is a general term, then you have things that are fossil based but compostable you know, bio-based, but not compostable or compostable. The stuff that is bio-based, there are environmental impacts there. There is water use, there's land use, there can be pesticide use, there can be monocultures, so impacts on biodiversity. Who's gonna be affected by that? Usually traditional and indigenous communities, first of all. Usually it can be associated with increased deforestation. So in Brazil, for example, we've seen a strong bioplastics lobby. Uh, surprise, surprise, they're the ones deforesting the Amazon because they're they're you know they're banking on monocrops that are replacing uh, the invaluable Amazon rainforest. So environmental impacts are there. So so you know our conclusion at Gaia for now is that maybe sometimes there might be niche applications where there's an essential use for a disposable material with those properties. And in those niche essential applications, maybe perhaps we can consider compostable plastics. That, that adhere to the, certifi to the certifications to ensure that there is compostability. But they're not a solution for mass products. They're not a solution for most of the, 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 the products for which we use single use plastics today. Um, and even that, even, that, um, even that niche application, that's limited by the science we have today. We are discovering more and more about nanoplastic pollution in soils. And so we really have to be careful and use the principle of precaution there. To what extent are these uh, compostable plastics really composting and what, what do they leave behind, you know, considering that they also have additives, colorings and other, and other substances that, that have or can have an environmental impact. So that's my little, my little uh, parenthesis there. I see that we have a few minutes left to wrap up. So I'm checking on, on the, uh, the discussion here in the chat and the questions in the Q&A. 
Um, and I see also Shyamala has rightly pointed to the huge cost of managing, of trying to manage uh, hazardous wastes uh, and, and the fact that all of these processes tend to leave to create hazardous byproducts, uh, whether it's char, whether it's ash, um, and those hazardous waste landfills, they can always leak. You know, we, we're, we're facing, uh, uh, you know, we've already seen it, uh, you know, rising pace of, of natural catastrophes, whether these are wildfires, hurricanes, you know, tsunamis, floods. And so how long are these hazardous landfills going to resist leakage? You know, and how long are these communities uh, going to be spared the toxic pollution from a neighboring hazardous waste landfill or other uh, sort of storage for hazardous waste? Um, and I, actually, on that point, I would point to uh, IPEN's excellent uh, reports on, on the problem of toxic ash that showed that even uh, in Europe, where we have stored uh, fly ash from incinerators in old mines, uh, we have seen uh, really high dioxin levels in neighboring populations of, of trout in neighboring rivers and streams. Um, and so we, we suspect that there's leakage going on there. So if, that's, hap if that, that's information that we have from years already, what can we expect in the years to come uh, you know, with, with uh, increasing natural disasters? Is it, is it really wise to be creating more toxic um, materials in the first place? So um, perhaps if, if anyone has any, a final word um, or a final thought that you want to share before we wrap up, this is the time. I'm going to jump in and just say while I can, um, I think we've come to the point in time where we have to regard plastics as really only being necessary for essential services. We can't continue to package goods um, in plastic anymore. The global plastic pollution crisis is, is showing us that we're um, polluting and poisoning the planet. But I want to just um, remark that the some of the best solutions I have seen in the world come from the Southeast Asian region. They, all, they have many fantastic solutions that are really um, uh, simple. You know, I, I have a, a, a big, I'm a big fan of, of uh, mushroom packaging. Um, a lot of these solutions already exist in the Southeast Asian region. So my plea is to uh, these communities to revert back to what many of the practices that you used to, to do, banana leaves, uh, uh, reuse systems, mushroom packaging, all the solutions are there. Um, we just need to avoid plastic as, as much as we can. And I understand that it, it there are some essential uses, but the scale of the problem is so large. Um, it, it's, um, it, it really is a case that um, Southeast Asia has the answers already. So I just want to make that point. Thank you, Jane. Okay, if I may uh, jump in now. Um, I've seen a lot of complicated issues and problems on the ground um, due to this plastic waste trade. And several times also um, I addressed this issue when I met the delegates of Australia, when I met the delegates uh, from other countries during the uh, con conferences, um, Basel, Rotterdam and, and Stockholm, and including the Minamata Convention. And also I, I met the UK Parliament member to address this issue because um, I said that uh, could you stop sending it to Indonesia and so on and the Parliament members the there are 28 Parliament members in the UK that submitted already the early day motion to uh, to prohibit the exportation of plastic waste however all this game is actually for the benefit of traders because um, the the traders are the one who really uh, make money um, but the exporters or the producers in 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 the global north, they they can get they still can get profits by polluting the environment, but they don't bear the cost. But the cost was covered uh, and and bear by the the destination countries by the importing countries. 
and that is still invisible cost because you know um we never quantified actually how much it cost us how much it cost our government and um the bribery and so on it's just you know for for a group of people so uh, many times i also raise this issue that if recycling is good why don't you do it in your own countries don't send it to uh, developing countries they they have less and less sophisticated technology if 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 the global north is so great and you can you know uh, send people to the moon and Mars and where else? Uh, why can't you make a good recycling plant so you don't have to send it to, to other countries? But this is about trade, you know. So when you ship many stuff from China to the US, the container should not be empty when they get back to the to China. So of course they fill it with with waste. And now China closed the door, so they because other countries do not say no. And especially if the containers are, you know, worth it, um, worth ten thousand uh, dollars, one containers to receive it. Why not put it in your pocket? So these politicians and and authorities that get bribed, they enjoy the 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 wealth maybe temporarily until we we name names 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 you know <laughs> name names um, and uh, it's it's annoying to 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 see that um, we have to shout first and then we have to remind our government and then they reacted. I, I don't know why people do not, I mean, authorities should, if they have a good uh, network with Interpol, with uh, all these customs organizations and so on, they should have had this hint or clue, hey, somebody's sending something to your country. For instance, the one that sent to Malaysia just recently, 110 hazardous waste containers that's supposed to be sent to Indonesia, but uh, ended up in Malaysia. And then now Malaysia has to handle it. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, it's the game of um, a group of people who, who wants to make money. So it's, it's sad, but unfortunately until 2020, we still have this issue. So if developing, if developed countries have a very good knowledge, lots of experts. We have to push them to design recycling plants that are more compact, more efficient, that they can use it in, 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 in the global north with very you know small numbers of, of human resources to operate. How how can you push that? You know, so if you have that solutions, we don't have this problem. So recycling at proximity if you still want to continue to produce recyclables. But of course, we all push for the non-recyclable, uh, the recyclability and then recycling rates and so on. So currently the recycling rate in the global north is not recycling. You only separate it, your waste and send it to us. So it's not recycling at all. Operating. Thank you, Yu Yun. Thank you for reminding us of these two important principles. First, the, the proximity principle, which is in the Basel Convention, because we know that the further waste go, the higher the potential for uh, toxic pollution is. Um, and the second principle that, you know, uh, waste exports are usually about outsourcing the cost of environmental management to, uh, to communities in the global south. Uh, and that is, you know, especially now with the COVID crisis and, and the related economic crisis, I mean, there is really no reason for importing countries to cover the cost of pollution that was designed by design, pollution by design that was made elsewhere and that was used elsewhere and that was exported. Um, I guess some final words. Hey, um, as uh, Jane and Yu Yun and Serene, you have covered a lot. Um, as uh, Gaia has always been saying, source reduction is very important yeah, in terms of uh, minimizing uh, consumption and also sustainable production. And also, um, yeah, most of our countries have signed on to the Basel man ban amendment. Um, of course, this has to be accompanied by um, good enforcement, yeah? adequate monitoring, uh, and you need to have the resources to do all the monitoring and enforcement measures have to be taken. And um, as mentioned by Yu Yun just now, developed countries have to be responsible in uh, taking care of their own uh, waste. 
they what when we had spoken to them they said oh this is commodity we are exporting commodity to you they're not saying it's trash yeah it's not trash to them it's commodity okay so uh, we should all be responsible in minimizing our consumption and also in terms of the exporting countries you take responsibility of your own uh, waste thank you Thank you, Magus. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Yu Yun. Thank you, Gaia Asia Pacific, for this webinar. Uh, we that's that's a wrap for today. Thank you, all of you who've joined us here on Zoom, on Facebook. Um, thank you. We have. Um, I think we've had a very important conversation that's also touched on all the aspects from from the reason for those for that toxic plastic waste trade to the solutions reducing its source. Um, enforcement enforcement and rejecting uh, the, 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 the transfer of the cost of toxic design and toxic pollution to countries that are not responsible for that waste. If you've signed up on Zoom, you will receive an email with the slides and the recordings. Um, and also next month, Gaia Asia Pacific will hold two webinar series, one on incineration and one on single use plastic bans. So please check out our social media pages for announcements. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook, uh, on Ga Gaia Asia Pacific, and also uh, you can follow us at Zero Waste Asia on Twitter and on Instagram. And our, our websites are uh, noburn.org and zerowasteworld.org. I will also put that in the, in the Zoom chat for those of you in Zoom. And uh, thank you so much for joining. Thank you, and thanks for everyone joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Goodbye. Thanks, Sri, Thank for you the all. Excellent moderating. Thank you. Yeah, Thank thanks, you. Thank you. See you, everyone. Lovely to see you. Good job. See you next yeah. time. Okay. See you next time. <laughs> yeah. The work continues. Hopefully it's face to face. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank Bye. You so much.